Hi, Dr. Solis. Uh, it's good to see you. Uh, my name is Abby Randall. I am Deputy Director at EcoRise um, and one of the co-presenters for this project. Our session is called Building a Green Texas, Activating a New Generation of Sustainability Leaders. Uh, my colleague, Brittany Jaru, is not able to join us today, but she'll be there in person in a few weeks. Um, and I'm thrilled to introduce you all to Dr. Solis, who's my co-presenter. Hi everyone, thank you for taking the time to watch this video and I'm thrilled to be presenting alongside uh, my partners Equal Rise um, and hope that you will enjoy the conversation ahead. So uh, this is a part of the course description, it wouldn't all fit on the slide, um, but uh, essentially today we're going to be talking about our Building a Green Texas project, which addresses um, the fact that we all know that climate change disproportionately impacts low, low income and otherwise marginalized communities like communities of color, and that it's these communities that feel the effects of climate change that are also underrepresented in the fields of sustainability and green building. So we're going to be talking about um, this project uh, that's three years um, across the state of Texas, which is helping to address these two um, overlapping challenges. So the objectives today of our session are to kind of dig into and describe the importance of a diverse workforce in these fields. Um, we'll hopefully be identifying resources and relationships that are necessary to design a place-based equity focused model, uh, like the one that we'll be sharing with you today, Building a Green Texas. Um, we'll be connecting with academics like Dr. Solis and community-based partners and telling you about some of those partnerships um, that we are leveraging to engage in culturally responsive education um, and providing resources related to these culturally responsive educational experiences <clears throat> uh, aimed to diversify fields of sustainability and climate resilience and green building. Miriam, anything you'd like to add before I dive into the EcoRise spiel? Yeah, thanks, Abby. So one of the things I want to point out is um, for many, it's just sustainability is a dominant approach uh, adopted by many planning organizations and firms in order to um, advance environmental protection initiatives or have environmental protection goals. Um, that paradigm as a whole has been critiqued, um, as many of us know, for not um, prioritizing equity um, along the way. Um, which, as we'll discuss a little later, can adversely impact historically marginalized communities. And um, one of the things that may be bringing some of you um, to this particular recording or presentation in person is that understanding. And for others, um, it may be the, the moment that we're in. Um, over the um, last year, particularly, we've seen um, a lot of the planning and, and design and architecture fields um, have a better sense of how um, racism ha continues to play a role in, in our profession. Um, and a lot of that has been, that increased awareness is a result of the movement for Black Lives and other movements that are responding to these disparate impacts. So, we acknowledge that um, in this particular moment, these conversations uh, may be for some of you longstanding and for others relatively new. Um, and um, either way, we hope that you'll find this information helpful in your efforts. Thanks so much for adding that in. Such an important component of what we're talking about today. So big picture, this is uh, this project is a result of many different partnerships, but particularly a partnership between EcoRise, which is the organization I work for, and the UT School of Architecture, uh, UT is the University of Texas, um, where Dr. Solis works. Um, EcoRise, we are a nonprofit. We originally are based out of Austin, Texas, and over the last 12 years have scaled across the country and in fact across the world to support over 5,000 teachers in the K-12 education space and their students. Um, our mission is to mobilize a new generation of green leaders to design a sustainable and just future for all. We uh, provide curriculum 
K-12 across a number of different themes. We're looking at sustainability, design thinking, biomimicry, green building, um, social entrepreneurship, all through the lens of hands-on, engaging, culturally responsive project or problem-based learning. We also provide teacher professional development, um, which is virtual in this moment in time, um, and student innovation grants, which bring student green ideas to reality to help them solve hyper-local sustainability and climate resilience challenges that they encounter um, at their school, in their community, and in their homes. Um, this particular project is based on our green building curriculum, which we'll talk about just for a moment. This is a uh, approximately 42 lesson module. It can be used a uh, course uh, made up of seven modules that can be used as a full year course, primarily for uh, career and art, career and technical education teachers, vocational um, teachers, although some environmental science teachers do use this curriculum as well, and it provides students with a foundation of sustainability and green building um, and really uses the lead rating system as a lens for looking at these different components. Um, this is a rapidly growing field, as we all know here uh, as green build participants. Um, and of course, the curriculum is designed to bring all students, particularly students of color and from communities that have not traditionally been um, included in these fields into the folds um, and create some of that career exposure and workforce development um, that's so necessary. <clears throat> so the project that we're talking about today is this collaboration between EcoRise and UTSOA called Building a Green Texas. Um, and as I discussed earlier, it's really addressing a problem that climate change is disproportionately impacting low income and communities of color <clears throat> that have the fewest resources to adapt. And it's these communities that are not being invited or centered in the conversation about how we solve these really complicated problems. Um, this is just a little snapshot of one part of the equation showing um, the racial identity of Americans in the fields of architecture, construction, and energy. And you can see that this is a predominantly male, predominantly white field, right? And so I think that these images, it can be pretty, pretty stunning um, and really drive the point home that there is a lot of work to be done in terms of diversification. Dr. Julius, before I move on to the next slide, anything you'd like to add here? Thanks, Abby. I, <laughs> um, I appreciate you um, asking me to chime in. Um, you know, I think one of the important parts of this uh, figure isn't explicit, which is that um, with regard to questions of diversity, organizational hierarchies very much shape outcomes. So even when a firm or a city agency is seemingly diverse, um, when you look at the hierarchy, it's actually people who are white, um, who are um, higher up in the organization. So organizational hierarchies are a very important part of the equation when thinking about questions of diversity within um, the firms and departments that we're working with. Thanks for pointing that out. So the purpose of this project, BGT, is what we call it, um, is to provide students, high school students, with opportunities to develop knowledge, skills, confidence, to tackle the challenges that are posed by climate change and that are very real for many of them currently in their communities. Um, and so the structure of the program uh, is really threefold. The first is that we're providing the curriculum, Green Building Lessons for a Sustainable Future, which I mentioned earlier, to the students' teachers. We are engaging schools in these communities in Central Texas and along the Texas Gulf Coast um, providing them with curriculum and then professional development to um, provide the context and the knowledge and the strategies for effectively, effectively implementing this curriculum. Um, 
This is paired with school year field experiences for the participating schools. So um, these teachers are bringing their students to four full day events facilitated by EcoRise and the UT School of Architecture and many of our other local partners um, focused on climate literacy and resilience. We're focused on exposure to green careers and then also bringing in local climate adaptation plans and different assets that help students understand what their elected officials and community-based partners are currently doing um, around climate adaptation, looking at both mitigation and resilience strategies. The third component are paid summer internships for students. Um, so students who were in the program participating in these field experiences, which were virtual in the year, in year one, um, unfortunately, <clears throat> um, are matched with green professional mentors from our partners at architecture, construction, and design firms, from school districts, from city offices, and community-based organizations. And they, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting a message that says my internet connection is unstable. Can you hear me okay, Miriam? I can. Um, and so these students participate in a six week paid internship, um, the paid piece being inc incredibly important from an equity standpoint, um, making sure students are being compensated and they're getting these very rich experiences working with other interns, working with EcoRise and UTSOA staff, um, and then of course their mentors working on projects. Abby, can you say um, just a little about how you find the teachers and schools to pair up with? In other words, how you ultimately um, get to work with the with young folks? Yeah, absolutely. So we're really focused. Um, you know, the challenge that we're looking at are communities that are disproportionately impacted by climate change and environmental hazard. And so we're looking at schools in those communities. So, for example, in Austin, we're looking at communities that are experiencing. Um, they're in urban heat islands and experiencing much higher temperatures than other parts of the community. Um, we're looking at communities that have been experiencing flooding over the last decade um, and displacement. Um, and so we're really focused on Title I schools or schools that have high numbers of free and reduced lunch, and then also schools that serve high numbers of students um, from communities of color. Okay. We have a little video to show you. I hope this will translate well in the recording. Miriam, please let me know if you can hear it. And Wilde Green Texas is a three-year project led by EcoRise and the UT School of Architecture. And it's designed to provide high school students with opportunities to develop, develop knowledge and skills and confidence to tackle the incredible challenges posed by climate change. As part of this project, we are designing four full day field experiences. This year they're virtual and today is the first one and paid summer internships, which will be hosted by many of the amazing green professionals that are with us today. And our goal is to provide you with valuable career skills and introduce you to the dozens or hundreds of different professions and career paths that are available to you in the field of green building, sustainability, and climate resilience. You know, this is going to grow, I have no doubt, into a nationwide program that's going to inspire students across the country to seek careers in sustainability and green building and help us develop a more diverse and more impactful green workforce. This project is funded through a highly competitive environmental literacy resilience grant from the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. We call them NOAA. And our hope for you over this next year is that you'll gain a deeper understanding of these complicated sustainability and climate issues, how they impact you and your family and your school and your community, and that you walk away with the knowledge and skills that you need to tackle the greatest challenges of our lives, of your lives, and that you'll design a more sustainable world for all. And that whatever your path takes you, you deeply value and advocate for sustainability and sustainable built environments that have a positive impact on the world around you and that foster healthier, happier, and more productive lives. 
we all know that climate change will be the greatest challenge of your generation. It'll be greater than COVID, if that's even possible for us to imagine in this moment. But amidst the heavy knowledge, I just feel so hopeful. I know that together, everybody in this virtual room will work to design a more sustainable and resilient world in which all of our selves and our families and our communities thrive. It is always difficult to watch yourself on video or listen to yourself. And it's very, this is a very weird experience to be watching a video while recording a video, but here we are in 2021. Um, and that was at our um, first virtual field experience, uh, which was last November, where we kicked off uh, with dozens of our local partners and um, about five of our local schools and the students that we were working with. Um, and introduce the project them um, and then jump right into career exposure and a session on urban heat islands and heat mapping um, and a session with the uh, materials lab at the um, University of Texas, which was an incredibly engaging event. The, the, some of the footage that you saw in that video uh, was in person, and that was from the previous year when we piloted with a school in Austin, and we were able to engage in these field experiences in person and engage in hard hat tours and tours of the Mexican American Cultural Center. And, um, you know, we have a vision to get back there one day. So this is the vision for building a green Texas, as we mentioned in the video. So this is the environmental literacy. Um, it's funded by an environmental literacy grant from NOAA. <clears throat> and so in year one, which we've just completed in this past year, we're looking at five schools, um, we're upwards of 100 students, four field experiences, 10 paid summer internships, and a showcase for the student interns to show off the work that they did with their mentors. Uh, obviously, it was a challenging year. Uh, we didn't quite reach all of those goal goals in year one but we're hitting the round, ground running in year two, where we're expanding to seven schools in Central Texas. We're beginning to work with two schools in the Texas Gulf Coast, um, continuing to host those field experiences and paid summer internships and showcases. And then finally into year three, where we scale up in both regions for a total of 20 paid summer internships for those students. And so I've mentioned partners many times, and our most important partner in this project is uh, working with Dr. Solis and her team at the UT School of Architecture. Um, Marion, would you like to jump in and talk a little bit about your role here? Oh, you're muted. Thanks, Abby. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our role um, at, in evaluating the program um, in a couple of slides. but. One thing that I want to point out is that the, how important this partnership has been for the UT School of Architecture as a whole. Our School of Architecture, which um, includes design and planning departments, um, is working like many other schools across the country on um, enhancing its pipeline efforts, particularly a pipeline that brings in students of color and first generation college students. And so um, the way that my colleagues and I at the School of Architecture see this um, partnership um, involves thinking about how we can um, enhance these relationships and cultivate them in a way that enables us to grow this pipeline. Um, but pedagogically speaking, it's also about um, how we rethink our fields um, and the role of what we might call non-experts um, in the planning field, in the architecture field, and the, the young people who participate in this program, as you'll hear a little bit more in a minute, um, can really help um, these professional fields rethink um, our curriculums, rethink um, how we do community engagement work, which is also a very um, important and growing part of our fields. Um, and so there are important, um, motivations that the school has for being a part of this work, but um, as a faculty person myself, 
And as someone who, like many others, cares a lot about the environment, it's rethinking who contributes to that process. Um, and I think the Eagle has developed a very important model for how to do that really hard work. Well, maybe the last thing that I'll say is that, so we're contributing both as evaluators and as Abby has pointed out, pointed out via programming. Um, one of the things that schools of architecture have are resources, and that's resources in the form of faculty, graduate students who um, are very willing to participate in workshops, materials labs. Um, and so we're not necessarily creating a whole new set of resources to engage in this partnership, but we're actually building upon what we have and making it more widely um, accessible via this program. Yeah, the resources um, and faculty and partnerships that the UT School of Architecture bring to this project are so valuable. The students get so much out of interacting with different faculty members, uh, especially those who, who look like them. Representation is such an important part of this work. And so bringing in folks from the university from all different backgrounds so the students can really see themselves in these fields, uh, bringing in folks working on sustainability. Um, it's just been such a powerful part of the experience and really also bringing in that environmental justice lens. Over the summer, um, UT facilitated Friday morning sessions for our students um, related to um, green careers and, and also with a strong environmental justice focus. And that was in our survey, some of the most impactful um, experiences the students had. We also have a number of other partners that we wanted to be sure to highlight. Um, and so many of you watching this probably represent organizations or firms um, that are similar to these partners. And so first off, you know, working with architecture, design and construction firms. Um, this is a photo here of one of our um, founding partners, um, Sita Lectionarian from BLDY Architects who um, mentored our initial first six students, um, taking them on a hard hat tour of a local uh, intermediate school that was being um, built, uh, aiming for lead gold, I believe, um, and then engaging students in lunch and learns um, in the office um, and really giving them that exposure to all of the different parts of life in an architecture firm and what it takes to get there and what it's like to be there. Um, we also have community-based partners. One of our current partners in Austin is Go Austin, Vamos Austin, that work on um, community engagement and climate resilience um, and worked with uh, one of our interns this summer um, on one of their, and one of their climate ambassador programs. Of course, school districts are very important here. We've worked closely with Austin Independent School District um, on both the pilot and year one of this project. They help us with recruitment of the schools and engaging the teachers, providing the teachers with um, credit for the professional development that they attend, um, really encouraging teachers to use this curriculum in their classroom, and then also hosting some of our interns. We had in, an intern host uh, with the uh, executive chef of Austin ISD, um, who's doing really incredible work around sustainability um, with their uh, energy manager, looking at all of the different um, energy efficiency components in their school buildings. Um, and then also, as I mentioned earlier, with, with local and national government, we're working closely with cities who can share about the local climate adaptation plans and strategies that they're engaging in. Um, and then of course, uh, NOAA, who is both a funder and also has incredible um, assets and resources to expose students to this work. All right, back to you, Dr. Solis. So I'm happy to step in here. Um, so we've laid out um, kind of an incredible program um, that EcoRise has conceptualized. And from a planning an urban planning perspective, um, I think one of the most exciting things about it is how many different folks it involves um, and decision makers, because we have um, city agencies involved, the school district, teachers. Um, I remember um, school administrators coming to one of our first meetings. 
So a lot of different folks are involved with this very ambitious goal of working with young people um, to enhance how they understand the environment, but create pathways for them to actually shape the environment, either through their professional careers or as residents, as community members. And so our role at the School of Architecture um, in this project is an evaluative one. And we're asking the questions, what are students learning and is this program shaping their goals for the future? Um, and we are going to be a part of this program um, for its whole duration. And so um, as part of our evaluation approach, we are um, writing annual assessments that we're sharing with the organization um, and other folks involved so that collectively the lessons that are generated on an annual basis or as we have those discussions um, can shape um, future iterations of the program. Um, Abby mentioned the application of environmental justice theory that's definitely foundational in this project. Um, we're also drawing on critical race theory and NOAA's environmental literacy ELP theory theory of change to assess short and select um, midterm outcomes. Critical race theory um, has been in the news a whole lot lately um, and has been become a very politically polarizing topic. Um, what it means for the purposes of this project is that we're working with youth um, with the understanding that they actually have a lot to contribute to our fields. They have a lot to contribute um, to how we understand inequality or the consequences of inequality and the responses that um, we need to develop to respond to those inequalities um, in the form of the interventions that we make in the built environment. Um, this is a concept commonly referred to as community cultural wealth. And the reason it's so important is that youth of color are often um, approached or engaged on the basis of a deficit perspective. So um, in this particular case, um, professionals um, or um, even teachers and administrators um, have been known to do this approach youth of color um, with the idea that um, they as older people or um, decision makers have something something to give young people and that they don't have something to give in return. We're trying to turn that idea on its head in this particular um, project. Um, and we're looking to see what those ideas are um, for how we rethink um, environmental planning in local communities. And um, NOAA's environmental literacy theory of change is very important because it's a very practical tool. And what I I think is a, a very great federal um, uh, framework um, to rethink how environmental inequities are happening in local um, communities, but also how communities are responding and um, practices that we know are important parts of that response. So they've identified six causal pathways um, that we're um, bringing into our evaluation work to understand how this particular program is meeting some of the short and medium term goals identified in these causal pathways. And um, here are some, um, well, the six primary pathways, um, things like active learning enables community engagement in civic processes. Um, and so you've seen already partly in the program design, how this is a very big part of um, the work that this project is doing. Understanding of cultural and historical context of place um, is important to building cohesion. Um, and that cohesion can also result in um, the environmental responses that are needed both for the purposes of uh, mitigating and adapting to, to climate change um, but also advancing environmental justice. And so in this first year, um, as Abby has pointed out, um, we've identified there have been some great things that, that have happened and also some things that as a collective, we've identified based on our theoretical orientations, we can adapt in coming years and continue to learn and grow um, as we evolve. Abby, can you, would you like to add to this, Abby? I'll have to ask you yet. 
Um, I, I was actually wondering, maybe we could share a couple examples. I think from the pilot year maybe is most powerful. I, I wonder, would you like to speak, uh, Dr. Solis, a little bit about the activity that we did around cultural capital when we oriented the mentors and the students? Yeah, so um, we did a few different workshops. I'll mention a couple, um, Abby, um, and I hope these these are the ones that you might be thinking of as well. If not, feel free to chime in. But um, a few of the things we did um, are um, actually not just to um, have youth go through workshops and orientations, but we also worked with the firm mentors um, in, in order to emphasize that um, being able to work with youth of color isn't a given necessarily, and there are uh, particular orientations, reorientations that need to happen in order for um, mentors to be open to the possibility of learning from young people. And one of the ways we did that is um, by talking about privilege and power, that um, uh, professionals um, usually come from a lot of privilege, um, if not um, in their life, then certainly in their current positionality. Um, and we drew attention to how the, that positionality start, um, stands in um, sharp contrast to the experiences that the youth participating in this program um, may be coming with. And we were very explicit about what some of those um, experiences may be. For example, um, be coming from a mixed status home where a parent um, or family members may be undocumented or having family with people um, who may have been incarcerated or um, living in a very low income household. Um, and how that, um, those particular experiences that youth may bring with them are actually um, very important ways in which they can contribute to the conversation. Um, and, um, and it makes them attuned to inequality. And so in one of, we had design workshops with students and uh, a primary, the primary case that the workshops were built around um, is the design and building of a green school uh, very close to where they are. Um, students in that first year drew attention to how their own high school um, didn't have sidewalks in a road that a lot of students walk on. And so that's an example of how young people and how they uh, perceive their built environment may um, point to things that are not part of the planning conversation being had or kind of the, the dominant, dominant or uh, most prominent um, planning um, and design initiatives. That's exactly what I was thinking of, thank you. Um, so I, uh, we use a few different methods. As a researcher, um, I call, I and many others who use these methods called this part, community-based participatory research. Um, so that we're actively engaged in this, these discussions on what we're finding um, in order to make uh, program adjustments um, and respond to what program participants are telling us. And so we do a few different things to identify um, these um, needed program adjustments. So we do participant observation. So myself or um, a student researcher will um, attend the workshops, um, whether we ourselves are presenting or not, to see how students are responding. Um, we're also doing interviews with program staff. Um, this past summer, we interviewed Equal Rise staff, as well as some internship mentors. Um, and we're engaging in youth feedback sessions. Um, we are looking at administration data. So where students are being placed for their internships, what kind of work they're doing. Um, and we're also doing pre and post program surveys to get a comprehensive sense of how students are experiencing the program um, and how we can make it even better. And so I, there are, um, 
There are output goals that were met this past year. 75% um, of students participating in the program identified as Black, Indigenous, or people of color and or female, and 90% of paid summer internship students identified as people of color and or female. And um, as part of this discussion, um, there were a lot of conversations had about how to equitably recruit students of color. And I actually think, Abby, this is one of the most important lessons that other folks running internship programs may find helpful. So I'll put that as a question to you because it's actually very hard um, to pull numbers like this off. Um, so this is certainly something um, to be happy with. And I'd love to hear more about how you're sharing with folks um, how EcoRise met this goal. Yeah, I'm happy to jump in. Um, I will say something we learned early on from our pilot was that simply identifying schools that serve mostly students of color is not sufficient. Um, you'll find when you get into capstone courses or senior level courses, specifically around engineering or architecture, there's some um, tracking that happens in those schools that end up in that many of the students who identify as white, even though there's only a small number of them in the school, end up being a majority in these classes. And so um, those were the classes we initially started with, and it turned out to be um, not a great strategy. And so I think what we learned from that is that being explicit about your goals with everybody involved is was the number one takeaway for me. When you approach a principal or a district administrator or a teacher, you have to be explicit about the kinds of students that you are looking to support. Um, <clears throat> I think sometimes people shy away from kind of difficult conversations about racial identity and um, this is not the place to do that. And so I think um, setting ambitious goals and then communicating them very clearly with everybody involved was really the key here um, for us in year two and achieving these. And would you say that that maybe um, kind of brought in not only the right partners, but perhaps generated greater enthusiasm? I, I found that people, um, the, the firm mentors, for example, um, found that as a huge draw to the program. Absolutely. I think it brought in exactly how you described it. It brought in um, the right the right mentors, right? The people that we were looking for and with higher levels of enthusiasm. Um, and I would say that this applies to the to the recruitment of the green professional mentors as well. Um, I can just to be honest, like as, as a white woman, I had a lot of discomfort initially approaching um, green professional mentors who are people of color and saying that I would like you to participate in this program in part because you are a person of color felt very uncomfortable to me at first. And I think really leaning into those conversations helps to be clear and helped us to recruit partners where, you know, the students need to be able to see themselves and their mentors. Um, it's one of the most important parts of this program when we're talking about diversifying these fields um, and, and supporting these students um, to, to pursue careers in these fields. And so um, to, I totally agree with you, Marianne, that um, it, it, it increased participation from both students and mentors who identify as people of color and the level of engagement. Yeah, thanks, Abby. And what I'll um, quickly point out is that in um, learning more about EcoRise as an environmental education, environmental education organization, is that they've actually made an, Abby, you can obviously um, speak to this more than I can, but as an outsider, I can see that they, and know that they've made a very concerted effort in, pre, in the last few years um, to develop um, their anti-racist um, approach. Um, and so there have been, there's a substantial commitment organizationally, but also resources have been dedicated to that effort. And so I think it's a lesson and perhaps it's certainly a separate conversation, um, but um, it's, it needs to be said because the infrastructure for this type of um, initiative has been years in the making. Um, and, and as I said, that's a separate conversation, but um, certainly something that needs to be noted as part of um, the historical foundations for um, the program. 
Yeah, that's such an important point. I mean, without getting into all the details, I, I feel confident that we would not have been able to provide such an impactful experience for our partners and our students three years ago, three before we made a really strong organizational commitment to creating a culture of race equity and an anti-racist stance. Um, we wouldn't have been able to have these conversations internally or with partners or be as explicit about our outcomes. Um, and that's been an incredibly important part of this work. Okay, here's that long quote. So I'm going to, um, just a sec. So I'm gonna briefly read it out loud. <coughs> um, oh no, I may need some water. So um, I'll try to keep going. So um, one of the, the things that the program was able to accomplish based on NOAA ELP's theory of change um, and the program goals that were created from the onset is that students who participated in the summer workshops and in the internships um, greatly increased their understanding of human and natural system interactions and climate change. So we saw students um, enhance their understanding as well as um, their application of a lot of the climate um, related ideas and architecture and planning ideas and principles um, that were introduced. Um, and this is one of my favorite quotes because it's a reflection from a mentor um, who's pointing out how a student um, went on to apply um, those ideas to something that they wanted to do um, in their future career. So one student mentioned wanting to go into some something like something merchandise, like furniture or design merchandising, but applying a sustain sustainability lens and perhaps looking at products that are used um, in fair trade. And the mentor thought that this was really interesting um, because they were learning um, be in a firm but the student was applying it to a field that they had considered previously. So there are, um, I'll, I'll speak briefly about two more areas that um, we, the program and as a collective, we did quite a lot of, um, but wanna continue to build on um, based on the theories that we're working with and the program goals that we have. Um, so one of them is, and this is something that's been hugely emphasized by NOAA, is linking these program activities to what's actually happening um, environmentally in, in their communities. Um, and formally speaking, this often happens in the form of not only how students or young people experience the environment, but also in climate adaptation plans, climate mitigation plans. Um, and other environmental planning initiatives that may be important. Um, so one um, goal that we've said is to continue to provide youth the tools and resources that help build their capacity to engage in these discussions and feel empowered to participate and get involved locally with the community around the relevant issues and priorities going on. Um, so um, based on our experience, some of that work engaged with um, local um, certainly local understanding, but not necessarily always local action. And so th those more action oriented initiatives, again, like climate plans, are the kinds of things we want to continue to fold into this project so that students see um, how they might be able to contribute to local um, climate planning efforts. And then another area that we want to continue to strengthen um, is um, to broaden our understanding of the social and economic implications of climate change. So this is, is this has been something that the program has understood from the onset, um, but we want to continue to incorporate. And with so many program goals, um, we I think we're making um, choices. Well, frankly, one of the limitations has been the pandemic. Um, in um, I think adequ adequately holding in social issues of social and economic inequality into the conversation. And I'll give an example. One of the things we identified early on is gentrification. 
as something that a lot of young people are experiencing. So some of the youth participants are seeing green schools being built in their communities um, and other what are considered environmental amenities, but their families they feel are being pushed out. And so uh, more explicitly bringing in those conversations to their internship experiences um, is very important in um, responding to the environmental justice concerns that need to be more uh, central to sustainability initiatives. And we do have some examples of that. For example, a couple of students participated in an internship with a local community-based organization that's a leader in environmental justice. Um, we held a couple of workshops that touched on um, themes of gentrification, um, but we want to build more um, consistency and folding that into every topic. Um, and as Abby has said, um, one of the things that that's going to require is consistently looking at our team capacities and making sure that um, our um, workshop leaders and participants know that that's an orientation that we want to continue to work with. I think a great example of the way we brought that into the program this year was around the sessions we did on the UT football club stadium. Um, those were some of the most popular sessions we did in the school year and in the summer, um, but we engaged um, local architecture and design firms who worked on the stadium to provide a virtual tour to our students and look at, it's an incredibly beautiful, sustainable stadium. Um, so we looked at it from a sustainability green building lens, and then we applied an environmental justice lens and talked about um, really the justice issues around the land that was being used um, and, and this issue of gentrification, um, what's happening to the land values, right? near the stadium or just simply folks who have access now to um, this kind of premier facility. So that was one of the most powerful sessions to have students. This is something in their community. Many of our students love soccer, you know, or soccer players themselves. And um, it, was, it was really powerful. Okay, that went quickly. Thanks, yeah. Um, we obviously don't have an audience, a live audience, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know if we can anticipate them, but I don't know, Dr. Solis, if you have anything else you wanted to add before we close? Um, well, one, one thing that I think isn't necessarily obvious, um, or that perhaps is, but that I, I take for granted as a collaborator is the importance of environmental education organizations and green building efforts is um, I think for firms and departments, um, there's a lot of untapped potential to build new collaborations. Um, um, and um, as I've said, I think that this idea continues to be very innovative and we look forward to continuing to share what we're finding um, both um, through these presentations and in, in other writing um, or um, material that we're able to work on together. And so we have our contact information here for you. Um, you can feel free to reach out to us, shoot us an email if you're interested in learning more or getting involved. You know, I, as I mentioned in that video earlier, I, I really see this as something that is replicable and scalable across the country. And we are running similar programs in San Antonio and Houston, um, and then up in Boston, Massachusetts. And we have big plans. Um, so definitely, if you're interested in this work, um, reach out. And we do have some free resources on the EcoRise website, ecorise.org, um, free lessons, um, all sorts of inspirational videos and blogs and things that can tell you more about the different projects that we have been talking about. Um, and if you want more, come see us in person in San Diego uh, and, and, um, and of course, reach out. Thank you so much. <laughs>